Okay, we'll start with this. Well, Joey DeVeco, he had this to say in regards to Murat Gassiev. Murat Gassiev, who was supposed to be facing Joey in what was to be their fight, essentially Murat's ascent into the heavyweight division, the land of the big men, the land of the giants. Joey's the guy that he was supposed to be fighting. And uh, according to Joey DeVeco, he had this to say. He says, okay, so this is the second time I was scheduled to fight Murat Gassiev. And like the first time, he pulled out again. The first time, I gave him the benefit of the doubt and understood that with his injury, he was not ready to compete. So I agreed to fight him on October 12th in Chicago. We found out he pulled out again, claiming the same injury. Now there's something fishy about this. I just think he doesn't want to fight me. Let's go, Murat. I want to beat the chicken out of you now for playing games with me. When are you going to fight me? Everybody share this. And, you know, Joey DeVeco, he's one of these guys who may seem innocuous to the eye, you know, because he's a heavyweight, but he's he's really on the smaller end of the spectrum. I mean, I mean, I mean Joey's smaller than, than, than Andy Ruiz. You know, they've got the same physical dimensions, more or less. They're both built kind of, sort of the same way, but Joey's actually smaller than Andy Ruiz. So this is a guy who's not big for the weight. So if you look at him, you think to yourself, this guy's running around up there with the with the Joshuas and the and the Ruizes and the Wilders and the and the Furies, and he very much is. And let me tell you that Joey DeVeco is better than advertised. Don't let his professional record fool you into thinking that this guy is some kind of walk in the park or something like that. No, sir. He is very much an adequate test for a fighter, particularly a cruiserweight. He's very much an adequate test for a guy who's moving up into the heavyweight division because not only is he solid, he has respectable power, and he's crafty, better than advertised, like I said before. But as far as Joey's contention that, you know, maybe Murat Gassiev is avoiding the fight with him, maybe that's not a fight that he wants, maybe, I don't know, maybe Murat or maybe his handlers, maybe they feel that it's too much too soon for, you know, for, for him to fight uh, Joey DeVeco. Maybe that's it. I mean, why would they think that? Well, you know, the rumors with the Anthony Joshua stuff, that, that might have something to do, it, do with it, you know. There were rumors that uh, Joey DeVeco dropped Anthony Joshua in sparring and left him concussed ahead of the Andy Ruiz fight. I mean, if you're looking for an angle, because that's what we're doing, we're covering all the bases, we're trying to understand why Murat would want to circumvent a fight with Joey. Well, you know, there's that. I mean, you can go with that. If you want to believe that, you can go with that. If you need a reason. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say this. I'm not going to throw around D word because that gets thrown around far too much in the sport of boxing in times where it simply doesn't apply. We don't know right now. We don't know that this is a fight that Murat Gassiev is attempting to circumvent. There are signs that he doesn't want the fight, but that's that's open to interpretation. For all we know, maybe the injury hasn't gotten better yet. We, we, we're not going to know. But I'll tell you this. If Murat Gassiev ends up fighting at or around that date against someone else, then, then we can call it a doubt. If Murat Gassiev is in action sometime in October around the 12th, but he's not fighting Joey, he's fighting someone else. If it happens that way, I think it's safe to say that, okay, something was going on there. Because if, if you skipped out on Joey for a fight that was supposed to go down on the 12th, you end up fighting somebody, say, I don't know, a week later? Okay, that's bullshit. That's bullshit, and it, it's, it's going to start to look like he didn't want that fight. So that's what I'm going to wait for. I'm going to wait. I'm not going to accuse Murat Gassiev of ducking. I'm not going to do that because a lot of people do that shit. I find it genuinely annoying because a lot of the time, that's really not the case. So we're going to wait. We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt one more time. We're going to see how it plays out. We're going to wait and see who does Murat Gassiev end up fighting next. Is it Joey or is it someone else? And if it is someone else, when does the fight go down? Because when the fight goes down is what's going to tell a story. I know some of you guys might be thinking that, you know, come on now. I mean, Murat's a good fighter. He's a big puncher. You sure there's any reason that he would try to avoid Joey? I mean, I, I figure that there's going to be people that hear this and they may immediately dismiss it. But remember, you got Joey, who's a pretty solid guy, better than advertised. But if that doesn't sell you, remember, Murat Gassiev is coming off an injury. That, that's what it is. That might be a reason why they might try to circumvent this particular opponent because maybe they don't want Murat working too hard fresh off the injury against what could be a solid guy, a guy who's better than advertised in Joey. And that way, yeah, I, I don't rule it out. But like I said, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. 
I'm going to wait. Why? In other news, Mike Kopinger tweeted this yesterday, and it reads, Joe Markowski of The Zone tells The Athletic the days of inflated purses are over at The Zone and that they had to pay a market entry premium. I think this means a lot of things, folks. I really do. Like what? I think what this means is that The Zone is going to want to have more of a say so in regards to what fights are going to be put on their platform and, and whether or not those fights are titillating and sizzling fights. Okay. The kind of fights that would give a boost to their subscriber base. I think that, you know, they made a splash. They managed to get a lot of big names on their side of the street and a lot of big fights are coming up. But what they want to do now is take a more active role in what's being shown on the platform, what fights are being made, what do they stand to make from those fights, and whether or not those are worthwhile investments, whether or not those are the kind of fights that'll help boost their subscriber base, i.e., they're going to take it up a notch. They're going to have to, because I reiterate, what I've been telling you all along, it's a very competitive market. It's competitive for the PBC, it's competitive for Top Rank, and it's competitive for DAZN. I mean, these guys, yeah, they're trying to shell out the best content that they can, but rest assured that they are trying to turn over a profit. I mean, they all are. Everybody is. So what I'm expecting is DAZN is going to take a more active role in the matchmaking, what the fighters stand to earn, and whether or not those fights are worthwhile investments. I also think this means that, you know, People should have got while the getting was good. You might recall that when DAZN first debuted in America, right? They were making active call-outs to a lot of fighters that were with a lot of other outfits. And they were willing to pay top dollar to get those fighters on their side of the street. Well, now, DAZN has more or less already built their stable. They got what they want. You got your Canelo. You got your Golovkin. You got your Andre. You got your, your Jacobs. You got your Usyk. Your Parker. You got your Katie Taylor on that side of the street, you know? You got your Anthony Joshua. Your Savannah Marshall. You got your Juan Francisco Estrada. Kevin Farmer. You got your Dimitri Bivol, your Billy Joe Saunders, you know? I mean, essentially, they have built their stable, so they've accomplished that. They've managed to get that done. And moving forward, I don't think they're necessarily in the market for big names anymore. Now what the task becomes is orchestrating the big fights. The biggest, the biggest fights. fights. As if they haven't been doing that already, but better still, with more of a focus at this phase, what is to be the second phase of, of, of their integration in America. endeavor, I think that's what they're going to focus on now. Before the focus was making a splash and getting the names. Moving forward, now it's going to be about putting those names, putting their stable of guys and gals to good use so that they can boost their subscriber base by making the titillating fights. You know, before it was about just getting people to cross to that side of the street. It was about getting the names. They've got the names now, and now it's time to use them, to really use them. You know, as far as, you know, trying to get people to cross the street, you know, the talent search, that zone was very much in the market for any and every fighter that was willing to cross over to their side of things. They were offering big money. Well, now, I, I, I think that those doors are closed. I do. I think that, you know, the Charlos, the Mikey Garcias, the people that toyed with the idea of maybe crossing to that side of the street, or, or at least people that they were hoping would cross to that side of the street, I think that at this point in the juncture, okay, that door is closed. It might be. Or they're not going to be as receptive to, to making those big cash offers because now you got your stable of guys and gals. You have that to work with. So it's not about getting talent anymore. Now it's about making the biggest fights. And, and anybody out there on the DAZN side of things who wants a really big fat purse, you know? They're going to have to work for they're it. They're going to have to work for it. They're going to have to earn it, you know? It was cool in the beginning and you're coming on, you're making big money, they're offering big money, you're making big money. Now it's time to kick it up a notch. They're going to have to turn up, they're going to have to make those guys and gals work for those big purses. They're not just giving them out like candy anymore. Now it's going to be about orchestrating the big fights so that you can get the big purses because at this point, they want a return on their investments. They, like everybody else that's out there, want a return on their investments. So what does this really mean? I mean, what should the fans expect to see? What does this result in? And I'll tell you, we got our first glimpse of this when DAZN gave Canelo Alvarez a short list of names for his next fight. For his next opponent, you know? And those were all sizable fights. Respectively, those were all decent sized fights because if, if they're paying you big money, then they want big fights. They want big situations. They're not going to give you that to fight Joe Blow and the ham and egg guy. No, no. You got to be involved in big situations and and this is trickling down to the other guys on the zone side of the street that okay if you want big money you got to be in big fights you know we're not just going to give you buku dollars to fight 
anybody USA. That that's essentially what it means. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because that was an eventuality. It was always going to happen. But this might so incline those fighters, leave them compelled to push for those dangerous opponent options the way that Canelo Alvarez is faced with a dangerous opponent. Because rest assured, Sergey Kovalev is a dangerous guy for Canelo. He is. Canelo, who ain't done a goddamn fucking thing at 175. We know that Sergey Kovalev is the most accomplished champion at the weight. He's certainly got a size advantage on Canelo. I mean, I understand that there is a faction of fans out there who want to convince you that Sergey Kovalev is some kind of cherry pick. But need I remind you that these are the same people that thought Andy Ruiz wasn't any good. It's the same they people. thought he was some walk in the park kind of guy. And we see how that worked out. I myself cautioned. I cautioned. Mid-range to inside, this guy's dangerous. He's got great hand speed and deadly counters. I didn't pick him to win the fight, but I acknowledged him as a threat. Whereas the same guys that are telling you that Sergey's a cherry are the same guys that were telling you Andy's a nobody. He's not bringing nothing to the table. These are the same guys that wrote off Luke Campbell. That, ah, uh, he's just another UK guy. Loma's gonna beat him easy. And the fight was anything but easy. You had to work for it. I mean, all the time, it's the same fucking people giving out these baseless opinions. All the fucking time. So believe me when I say that Sergey Kovalev is not a cherry pick for Canelo Alvarez. And it's that kind of a fight, that kind of a dangerous situation, a titillating situation, but a risky one. That the zone is going to expect of their fighters of their fighters who are expecting big purses that okay you want a big purse we'll compensate you but you got to be involved in a big situation that's essentially what it means and what that could result in is more titillating fights more risks for more risk takers so it's not a bad thing for the fans and anybody who thinks that canelo alvarez isn't taking a massive risk jumping up two weight classes for the likes of sergey kovalev who's got a concussive jab let alone a concussive right hand. You know, I see all variety of these people. They're bringing up the odds makers. They're bringing up, you know, how the bookies have it. And and it, the whole time they're doing this, I'm thinking to myself, hey, how did the how did the bookies have Joshua versus Ruiz? Huh? How did the bookies have Jarrett Hurd versus Julian Williams? Huh? How did the bookies have Jorge Linares versus Pablo Cano? Huh? How'd they have Come it? Come on, how'd they have hey, it? Hey, hey, how'd the bookies have Fury versus Valine? Did their odds reflect how the contest played out. Did it? I mean, everybody, including me, viewed Otto Valin as a guy who really can't pose much resistance, but that's not how it worked out, did it? So don't bring me how the bookies have got it, because the bookies have had a lot of fights a certain way beforehand, but how it played out was very different than what they had. Don't bring me the bookie shit, okay? Don't bring me your opinions. Don't bring me your conjecture. For any guy who is jumping up two weight classes for a world champion, there is always a risk involved. Maybe it's not the biggest risk. You know, maybe there are riskier guys at 175 for Canelo to fight. I mean, I don't even dismiss that, that there are bigger risks there than Sergey. Yeah, of course there are. But that doesn't mean he's not taking one with Sergey. That's a risky fight. On one end, you know, Canelo does have the, 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 the kind of upper body movements to maybe work his way around Sergey Kovalev's jab. Maybe he does. But on the other end of the spectrum, Sergey Kovalev's jab isn't just any jab, it's an ever-present jab, and it's a jab that he employs while he's on the move, making him that much more difficult for a smaller man to not only work his way past that jab, but get in position to land those body shots, those body shots that everybody swears are going to fold up Sergey Kovalev. Maybe they do, but he's still going to have to work for it. And getting peppered with a jab at 175, well, let me tell you something, it's not the same thing as getting peppered with a jab at 160, okay? Let alone from a guy who knocks people down and knocks people out with his jab. But these guys will tell you it's not a risk. Look, that fight heralds what this DAZN thing means. That That's what it heralds. That Canelo Alvarez had certain options. He doesn't really feel like facing Triple G for whatever reason. Could be that he doesn't want to deal with him. Could be he's tired of him. Could be he doesn't want to give him the satisfaction. It could be any myriad of things. But he had to choose an option. And he ended up with a risky option nonetheless. Maybe an even riskier option. Because Sergey Kovalev stands more of a chance of knocking Canelo out than Golovkin does. Golovkin already tried at this kid two times he couldn't knock him out. What the fuck makes you think he's gonna knock him out in the third fight? He'd likely get robbed again or actually lose. But Sergey, Sergey's got a concussive enough punch that he could hurt Canelo in a way that he's never been hurt. So it's a risky fight against the naturally bigger guy who just so happens to be a world champion, a defending world champion. This is what this news really means. That the guys and gals over there at the zone if they want to make big money, they're likely going to have to take big risks. And just in keeping with 
the big risks that Canelo Alvarez is about to take against Sergei Kovalev and insight into what he means to do thereafter, provided he wins. You know, he's saying he does mean to go back down to the middleweight division, that he wants to be an active champion over three weight classes. You know, so he does intend to move, move back down. And that's what I figured. He's going to go back to middleweight. I just don't think it's going to be a, a sharp descent because Canelo Alvarez has enough people around him that they're not going to let him do something stupid like that. You don't just drop back down and you don't just drop back down for any old body. So what, you know, what could end up happening if he wins this Kovalev fight, though it's not a foregone conclusion, he does. But if he wins, I'm expecting either a fight at 168 pounds or maybe a fight at a catch weight between 160 and 168 because you know a sharp drop like that after having fought at 175 it's ill-advised and we all have the cautionary tale of Roy Jones Jr. and his sharp descent after he took on John the Quiet Man Ruiz and dropped back several pounds you know that it's 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 not something you do you shouldn't do it Canelo Alvarez is enough of a money maker enough of a cash cow that his team those around him will have have the foresight to make sure that the drop is a safe drop. I'm not expecting a very interesting opponent option after the Kovalev fight, provided he wins. I'm not expecting him to jump in there with a killer. I'm not. I expect it to be a solid matchup, but I'm not expecting some 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 murderous guy. I'm not. Not a Golovkin. Not an Andre. No, no, no I, I'm not. Not in that succession. As stated, you know, I figured that Canelo has no intention of campaigning here, you know, from here on out as a light heavyweight because the you know in, in all actuality there are more dangerous opponents in that division than Sergey Kovalev that doesn't mean that Sergey's a walk in the park that doesn't mean he's not a risk that just means that there are riskier guys there but rest assured and jumping up two weight classes for Sergey yeah he's taking chances big chances you know so he does mean to drop back down as far as that Golovkin fight he's still making it clear he's finished with that guy that's what he's saying he's saying he's finished with that guy I'm sure John Skipper and the people over there at the zone they got to be feeling something about that because we all know they want that fight we all know that that's a big part of their bottom line in the middleweight division so while Canelo may be saying he's finished with him I'm not sure that that fight is completely off the table not as far as the zone is concerned and not as far as golden boy is concerned because you know they probably made certain promises to get that deal done. And I'm pretty sure that that third Golovkin fight was one of those promises. And that's why Oscar keeps indicating that it's still a possibility. Even at a time when Canelo's saying, I'm fucking finished with that guy. So, you know, we'll just see what happens.